Stephen, I hope. Oh, yeah. Jack. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Good. Seems like a long time ago already. <laughs> Once you hit Monday. All right. Did well, you get uh, on? They're on? I may be pressing the wrong thing. I can oh. hear you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're here. Mary Louise is trying to get on in her her yeah. her iPad. Get, okay. Do it on your yeah. iPad. Yeah. Okay, hang on. I think it's two rows, but I don't think that's going to work. I'm going to try. Hi, you guys. <laughs> Hi. All right, so this is the uh, last of our um, experiment in Zoom. Uh, Bible studies. I, I do pull up a chair. That's I hope okay. That it's been uh, helpful for you in some ways to expand your uh, understanding of how people have seen Jesus over um, history, and therefore give you um, maybe more uh, choices when it comes to answering the question we started with, which is, I don't know. you know, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And I think the um, the answer has to be made uh, in every era and by every single person, really. Um, we, we certainly have some baseline agreements that he is God's son in our creed. He's uh, the savior and he's the Lord. Um, and those are um, necessary, I think, before one can go further. But these other views have, I think, also shown us that there's more to Jesus than just a few titles, but uh, he's a, a a figure in history that has in, enlightened people and inspired them uh, to um, uh, great things and to um, face their their own context with, with um, resources come from him. And so. Um, we're looking at uh, the last couple tonight and then a chance for some feedback, I think. But just going back again, um, anyone have any uh, questions about where we've reached uh, up to at this point or anything just about uh, Jesus in general that they want to throw out there um, to begin with? <clears throat> Oops, I forgot. Any questions? Oh, Jim is in there. Hey, James. Good evening, Pastor. How are you, sir? Doing well, sir. How are you? Excellent. I was just asking the group if there were any of the um, images of Jesus that had become especially meaningful to them. I, I got a, a note back from Steve Pudnick today that uh, he really became... Um, Kind of uh, inspired by the romantic era image of Jesus, especially in the one painting that showed um, Jesus as a baby and the light uh, in the picture coming from Jesus mm. upward to the right. people. And, uh, you know, how that's not realism, because realism would be light from another source, but how it's it's a romanticism. And uh, I think there's quite a... Um, a number of us that would be influenced by the images of the romantic era because that era um you know is soon enough in our time frame to still have a, a continuing effect um it's in the, uh, many of the hymns that we love many of the paintings or images that we love and i think it filters its way uh as steve said into even our current uh, modern praise music because one of the verses um, from the uh, a song we sang on Sunday, um, for him that that matched up with that painting, that the light was coming from Jesus. Um, in in he made that identification, uh, so I was really excited about that uh, because it might not have been a connection he would have made before. Anybody else um, thoughts that have come up in the process of going through these centuries? Questions down. So, Andy, not, not so much from the uh, uh, going through the centuries, but the images in the book that 
I don't know if everybody has it or not. Uh, they're much more meaningful when you're able to look at them and interpret it because I'm not that skilled in interpreting art. And uh, words I can look up. You can't look up art and Google it and see what is going on. So uh, it's been extraordinarily helpful to have you give the insights on the interpretation of some of the images. Well, I tried to I've tried to do that, but I've gotten my uh, my main input from the book itself. Obviously, um, I've been learning along with you, maybe uh, one week ahead of you <laughs> uh, in the process. Um, but wow, has it been a valuable um, experience for me? And uh, I agree the the book with the uh, illustrations has been a, a very enjoyable to go through. Um, I'll send you a link to another uh, website. Uh, that has uh, some more images in in a nicely done um, format, um, and, and it gives you the dates. And it's interesting to look at the dates that the paintings were or the artwork was done to see um, the uh, the correlation again. Now you know uh, the the author Pelican can only make these broad statements. He can't say that during the century of Romanticism that the Enlightenment meant ideals weren't still in effect, nor can he say that um, people didn't think about Jesus as a rabbi 500 years afterward. These images didn't just uh, come and then just go. But one thing I think we could see is that whenever an image came, uh, quite often there was either an image that followed that either built off it or actually in some senses balanced it. And I, we saw that exactly in the case of the Enlightenment a very rational, moral teacher followed up by a beautiful savior uh, in, in, and how there was, seems to be an equilibrium that I guess we could ascribe to the Holy Spirit working through, I shouldn't say I guess, we can ascribe to the Holy Spirit working through the centuries as well, maybe helping people get the image of Jesus that they need to face the challenges of their century. Um, and so that's something for us to think about what images do we need not ones that are manufactured out of thin air. All of these had uh, scriptural um, references, I think, and and nearly, I think all of them have had what we would call traditional uh, attestation. That is the church or churches, um, you know, did not disapprove of them. Now, there's certainly some image of Jesus that, uh, and some ideas about Jesus that that were not approved and may have had less or no scriptural support, including some of the images that we might even have today. Um, but I think this gives us a, a, a good baseline. Was anybody surprised about Thomas Jeff Jefferson and his Bible? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't realize he cut it all up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's, that's a unique way of editing. Yeah, yeah, it really is. You, you know, you, I, I, I brought this up. I brought this up. Uh, I don't know last week or the week before, but I've done some more thinking on it about. About, I guess I'm disappointed in the time period after Luther, when instead of being able to think of Jesus and settle their differences, we ended up with a 30-year war and a hundred-year war, and all of these people were killed, all thinking that they had the right connection to Jesus without thinking about other people. And the more I thought about it in the last week or so, I was thinking, you know, this, it was the intertwining so much of the, of the uh, government and the church, how intertwined it was back in those ages. And I, I think that's what probably ended up driving, although I think we've gone, gone too far, but it's what drove the separation of church and state in the United States when they finally left England and the Netherlands and came over to the US. But it's just, uh, it's, it's sad, really. I mean, they, everyone believed in Jesus, but because of stupid little scenarios, they were killing each other over it. Right, right. That's a really good observation. And indeed it is disappointing. And it does get leveled against Christians, that very thing. Well, we're gu we were guilty then, that's for sure. Christians, you know, Catholics against Protestants, even though they they both believed in God and Jesus. But that's right. 
right? Yeah. Well, we have two tonight, and then uh, again, some more time. I hope to come up with uh, images that uh, you might want to share uh, about uh, where the book ends and where you might see um, the answer to the question in our very time. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is Jesus as the Liberator. And um, this is uh, going to take place in the um, time frame where uh, many um, uh, many um, of the social structures are going to be um, upended. This is a fascinating uh, picture of Jesus in the middle. Um, love, um, thou shall love thy neighbor is is the banner here and then you have the the jesus blessing the slave and casting away the master uh, come to break the bonds of the oppressors um and so you have the, the images of the slaves here and their and their release over here um this was the name of a newspaper the liberator but it, it's a perfect uh i think way to kick off uh, this particular um uh, vision or understanding of Jesus. And of course, this is uh, around our own um, civil war, but uh, we will see there were many cases up until real, very recent where uh, Jesus is seen now as someone who is going to have an effect on the social structure. So this is not quietism. This isn't uh, the Jesus who wants you to go into the closet and pray. You know, this isn't the Jesus who um, says, um, you know, I've come to give you the endurance to get through um, your adversity. This is the Jesus that says, I'm going to do something about it. We're going to be, we're going to do something about this and very active understanding of Jesus. And, and uh, we'll see uh, controversial to say the least in this context, the, uh, 19th and 20th centuries, there were a lot of social uh, upheavals in social orders. Uh, so you had um, the fall of monarchies uh, and the rise of democracies. I don't know if anybody watches The Crown, but we're watching, we just watched the episode um, as they're debating whether the there's any room for the monarchy in England anymore, um, even though it, it uh, uh, isn't really the kind of monarchy that that it once was, um, but the idea that uh, we are putting down that kind of um, um, imperialism of the monarchy. Remember that the uh, one of the images for Jesus was as the one who was the king over the kings and the one who gave kings their authority. So the, the, the fall of kings uh, was a significant uh, religious um, statement. Um, and uh, we talked about Napoleon crowning himself as, as an image of that, um, 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 taking away the authority of, of uh, Jesus or the church over the uh, leadership. Uh, colonialism, uh, which had been growing since the age of discovery, um, and then we see a rather rapid um, period of time where uh, these nations become, once again, independent. Um, and what does that mean when the colonial power uh, quite frequently, if not always, was a Christian power that you're overthrowing? What, what happens with that if the, uh, the colonial uh, occupier is a Christian and now you're free? Are you going to be free from that religion too? Obviously, slavery to freedom, and we know that slaves, um, despite the fact that they were often kept in place with religious um, uh, use of uh, or uh, use of scripture and uh, preaching, um, slavery uh, slaves actually uh, had a very strong faith that, that uh, saw Jesus as the very reason for their um, right to freedom, and so they they remained Christian in universal numbers. Uh, despite the fact that Christians had enslaved them. And then we have the inequality to equality, the women's movement, and what we could say today is the movements for um, uh, those who had gender identification 
for sexuality identification um, uh, concepts for themselves um, and how there is obviously a religious dimension uh, for that um, from the women to, to present, present day uh, issues. Uh, unfortunately, the institutional church is often on the side of the oppressor. That is, the church has been in charge and the, uh, uh, therefore in uh, cahoots with whatever oppressor has been in, 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 um, in charge. So um, when um, Britain went to a shore and, and took over a uh, nation, it came along with the Church of England. Um, Germans did with uh, less success uh, in, in their, their uh, transportation of Lutheranism. We weren't really that good at it. Um, but certainly uh, the idea that Christianity um, showed up with the conquistadors and the um, discoverers and quite often then um, took a, a toehold and claimed for themselves the, the spiritual or the souls uh, just as um, the discoverers would have claimed the territory of those who were there. Interestingly, scripture is used on both sides of these issues. So that's nothing new. Uh, and in some cases, quite a bit of work has to be overcome because in much of the New Testament, there was no concept that um, there would be um, uh, an idea that there would be no slavery. Um, that, that, that doesn't seem to have occurred, except in occasional circumstances to, to any um, anybody in, in a significant way. It was a state of existence to be a slave. And certainly wow. women were in uh, a state of yes. their rightful wow. place uh, as seen in, in um, scripture in, in, in some views of it. So this context, not that long ago, right? Uh, Any questions Andy, about that? On uh, the scripture being used on both sides of the issue, it reminded me that during World War II, both Hitler and uh, Patton and um, uh, Eisenhower prevailed on the Pope to bless their battle plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And Nazi soldiers and uh, or, or, um, German soldiers and English soldiers sang Silent Night together, <laughs> uh, you know, on Christmas Eve truce. Um, somehow not able to, to find the Prince of Peace in that situation. So um, that is the dynamic. Again, I, I think it's, it's uh, still in effect in some areas to, uh, of our culture today. Scripture that's used um, regarding government, the Romans, everyone must submit to governing authorities. You know, just there it is. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Now, people who do biblical studies can put this in uh, maybe a nuanced context, but as it plainly reads, um, what does this say about a um, dissatisfied group of people in a particular country who want to, um, to, want to affect change? What would it say to them? Are they on the right side or the wrong side of this? No, all, all revolution would be wrong, right? All revolution, because whatever governing authority you're in must be respected if you read it that way. And it was certainly preached that way. Uh, in Ephesians, slaves, be obedient to your human masters with fear and trembling insincerity of heart as to Christ. How often do you think that was preached in the uh, plantation church? <laughs> right? Sure. All the time. Probably every other Sunday. Now, uh, the women love this, uh, Timothy. A woman should learn in quietness <laughs> and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. All right, Lorraine. You got to you got to be careful with, with don't don't tell Lorraine that. Yeah, Lorraine's <laughs> ready to throw something at the screen. You got a reputation. 
You know, you guys ought to be careful. That's right. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's a very unpleasant thing that you're referring. I know. Uh, now, and when I say both sides, now, now look at this from, from Paul. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This was, um, you know, the same person who's just said some of these other things. And then uh, in Galatians 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Again, when these are interpreted within the context of the scripture, when there's, these are um, interpreted within, within the, the theology of the writer, um, they can be moved in different directions. But when they, when they are read as plain scripture, in a one isolated line after line, um, I, I think you can see why there was a dilemma. Um, some people saying he's the liberator and others people saying, no, he's, he's not a liberator. He might be a comforter. He might be your balm in Gilead, but he's not the one that's gonna take you across the Jordan River. At least as now, as far as we can see at this time. Right. So scripture, um, in the end, I believe um, you reached a bit of a loggerhead uh, in this matter because people could quote scripture back and forth, um, you know, kind of like all day long at each other. Um, in, the, in the end, um, what really prevailed, I think, and according to Pelican, what prevailed is that they, they couldn't reconcile the, the Jesus they saw in the gospels with inequality with slavery with um any of these oppressive states he was in word and deed a man of compassion for the sick for the lepers for the downtrodden um one who um you know looked upon these people with if not um, liberation of their bodies or their temporal time, he was certainly there to liberate them in spirit. And, and therefore, I think the prevailing view uh, that was finally appealed to was, you know, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Yeah, go ahead, James. So I, I've got a question. You said something interesting about 10 minutes back and, and, Sadly, I, I think you're spot on that the church has typically sided with the oppressors yeah. throughout history. Yeah. Jesus sides with the oppressed. Yep. And my question is, um, this the, um, this disconnect. I mean, I'm thinking of Dostoevsky and his great, and the brothers cut him off in the, the chapter of the Grand Inquisitor when Jesus comes back and the church says to him, "We don't really need you. We've got this. You just just go away." Um, is that the root of this? This just kind of disconnect between the actual historical Jesus and what the church kind of created? Well, you, you'd like to think so, but you know, with the translation of the uh, New Testament into a uh, vernacular uh, slightly before Luther's time, but in, at least definitively in Luther's time, one would have thought that would have freed Jesus up for um, everyone to be um, convicted. Um, now, that just didn't happen. Um, even Luther himself, who, who knew this Jesus as well as anybody could have, decided that when the peasants revolted, it was just bad form, hmm. just bad form for them. It's going to mess up the proclamation of the gospel. Um, and I, I think we could see how it, it it gets safer to leave things alone. It just gets safer to leave things alone. One of the things that um, I'm quite aware of is, is that um, I haven't met very many people that, that urge politics from the pulpit. Um, and so therefore you, you, uh, you have a very um, clear um, directive, which is leave things alone. <laughs> When my, when my pastor, uh, when I was growing up said, 
that he didn't think we should be in Vietnam, according to his faith. They said, we don't care. <laughs> we don't care what you think about that. And we don't care if it has to do with your faith, you know. Um, and so um, the, 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 the power that is the church accommodates itself to that and good things happen um, in, in that partnership. But there's also this um, disturbing idea that maybe Jesus didn't come for that kind of purpose. Um, and, and the whole idea of um, did Jesus come to find, you know, to to start a institution uh, or did he come to, mm. you know, transform our lives? And uh, so, yes, uh, we'll look at that, especially when it comes to the uh, the liberation theology here at the very end of the uh, South and Central American, uh, especially Central American uh, communities. Uh, one who was very conflicted about this was uh, Abraham Lincoln. We'd like to think he was a um, full out abolitionist. That's not true at all. Um, not in the least. He, um, for one thing, the other thing is uh, he didn't necessarily base any of his view on the freedom of slavery on Jesus. He doesn't mention Jesus. He wasn't much of a churchgoer, and he didn't belong to any religious uh, community. Again, we talk about the faith of our fathers, but read, if you read on about Lincoln, he <clears throat> he was much more like Jefferson than than uh, than we might have expected. But he did um, have this conviction that comes, you know, from the founding of the country. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Um, why did he emancipate the slaves? Um, cynics, and also his own words, could say uh, it was a very potent uh, weapon against the South. It was destabilizing to say the least. Um, and he was able to enli enlist um, uh, slaves in droves into the Union um, sympathies. But I think you'd also have to say that there's plenty to be um, found in, in a Lincoln struggle, struggle to try to come to terms. In some debates he had, he, he talks about how if you're going to judge someone by their color, uh, beware of running into somebody whose skin is one shade lighter than yours. <laughs> so those of us who are might be tan uh, are going to run into trouble um, if we base our thinking uh, on the color of, of skin. The the only the um, the albino, um, <laughs> which I'm pretty close to, <laughs> um, is uh, is is at the superiority of the uh, of the spectrum, I guess. And he was being, you know, ironic about it. Certainly, um, he did come to be seen um, as the great emancipator, and I think he paid the price for that. That probably was, you know, a significant reason for his assassination. And maybe he even knew that at the time, but definitely um, a almost Christ-like figure in this picture, you know, where he's, you know, standing there with, with conviction pointing to the heavens um, as he's embraced by the slave or the freed slave. Any Lincoln fans out there want to add anything? <laughs> Then we come to the next series of people uh, inspired by what I think was more directly from Jesus, um, and in particularly speaking, in the Beatitudes, um, and that would be surprisingly a Hindu lawyer in India who successfully leads a nonviolent resistance that frees India from the colonial uh, occupation of Britain. And that's Mohandas K. Gandhi. Oh, mm -hmm. He uh, he believed in Jesus's turn the other cheek more than maybe anybody had ever believed in it before. 
Um, and he led a nation to adopt that philosophy, demanding their rights to freedom nonviolently. And he uh, was a great admirer of Jesus. He remained Hindu, but a great admirer uh, of Jesus. Then we have the suffragette movement and the women's equality movements um, that certainly came out of churches, although they didn't always find welcome there because churches were in some ways the last bastion, uh, again, of this Paul uh, idea of women being submissive. Um, you know, the, um, the, the wedding vows used to require submission of the woman to the man, but not the man to the woman. When the vows, you did not have to promise to be obedient to your wife. Only your wife had to promise to be obedient to you. So now I've been paid good money to say that. <laughs> vows. But I've always refused it. And then we have uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, who was also inspired um, by Gandhi. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Jesus as a preacher uh, who led the civil rights movement, which should have been a bloodbath um, and instead was one of the, the most amazing um, movements um, in modern history yeah. of, of giving rights to, um, well, nearly everyone benefited from the civil rights movement in the end. All of these um, examples, although Gandhi is Hindu, inspired by Jesus, um, and certainly uh, Dr. King, inspired by the idea of Jesus, the liberator. He doesn't ask you to uh, remain in your oppression. He doesn't require that you remain silent in injustice. Uh, rather, he um, has come to set us free. And so... Um, we end up with a you, interesting circumstance where now religious uh, leaders find themselves face to face with the uh, political leaders. The flesh versus the spirit. And this continues. We're we're in the midst of uh, ones that uh, that our kids are are more tuned in than we perhaps. But the um, the uh, sexual preference and and gender identification, uh, the LGBTQ movement, has uh, both uh, support and opposition within religious communities, mm -hmm. um, and uh, some you know, are very much at the forefront of it and others uh, in the vanguard in back of it and all of us appealing to scripture, <laughs> all of us going back to scripture and uh, <laughs> that would be uh, a whole nother topic. But this certainly uh, is the mood, the understanding of Jesus as the liberator gives people the sense that um, they should not re you know, remain in their um, oppression, whatever it might be, or their restriction, or their lack of equality. Now we move to a time that that uh, is closer to mine, and some of you might remember, but that's the time of the birth of what's called liberation theology. Liberation theology is a a, a way of thinking about um, about God, but uh, Jesus, of course, that um, sees that. There is a, um, uh, that God sides with the poor and the oppressed, that given, given all circumstances, um, God is on the side uh, of those who are experienced, uh, experiencing oppression. And that um, is the liberation theology, understanding that the preferential option for the poor that preferential option, that is, God prefers to be on the side of the poor, and that's a scene uh, in Jesus. And if you look, you know, the, the stories lend themselves to that. Although Jesus did, um, of course, come for all, again and again, he seems to side with 
the ones who are oppressed. Um, this particular disturbing image is the assassination of Bishop um, Oscar Romero. And I actually have this uh, painting, uh, or the, the print in my office. Uh, it was given to me by my internship pastor. Um, and he was very active uh, in uh, liberation theology, supporting the sanctuary movement in uh, Chicago at the time, where people leaving those countries were seeking sanctuary. Romero spoke out for the poor and was killed at the altar as he was lifting the chalice and saying, this is the blood of Christ. The, the assassination took place uh, in the mass. Was and this so, in Chicago? No, this took place in El Salvador. El Salvador, okay. Yeah. But uh, because of Chicago's connection to those countries, it, my internship supervisor was was very involved. So I look at that periodically and say, uh, hmm, how am I doing with uh, proclaiming the freedom of the captive in, in my work? Um, and that's one reason I'm so grateful to be involved with Freedom Challenge because of our anti-human trafficking ministry. Um, I'm certainly not uh, in danger of being assassinated for it, but I am grateful that I can um, be on the side of liberty. And for all of you who've been supporting, that's you know important. But it was the government, you know, it was the government that uh, that uh, arranged for the hitmen to come. Mm. So liberation theology is the culmination of uh, of these images of Jesus as the a liberator. Any thoughts or questions? I was just thinking you you said it was the the government that arranged it. It's like going back into the 1500s again. You know, it's the yeah. same. It's the same church uh, government connection. And it's greed or ego or whatever you want to call it, but it, it's not wanting to lose power. So you're able, you would actually go out and murder in whatever name you're murdering because yes. you don't want to lose power. Yes, absolutely. Yep. All right. Ne next and last, chapter 18. He -he -he. Wow. <laughs> The man who belongs to the world. Here we we have a wonderful uh, painting, the the uh, called the crash, and uh, you see a rather traditional crash. But look at all the people who have come to it, uh, different colors and hues. Um, I wonder if this is the painter here, who is looking at us, um, and the idea that um, is rather remarkable, which is this this Galilean peasant becomes a man who is known in every corner of the world. Over 2 billion people out of the 8 billion in our world uh, profess to be Christian. Uh, and it is still the largest single uh, faith system. Um, although Islam's birth rate uh, in their countries are higher and we may be eclipsed uh, at some point, um, it's still re very remarkable that we have um, uh, that uh, the idea that all nations will come to him uh, has has surely surely been um, realized uh, in in at least the geography. Uh, if you look at the context here, the 19th century was a great time of European expansion, and hand in glove Christian evangelism throughout the world. Uh, look at the numbers here. By the end of the first century, 800,000 people. Um, Christian. By the end of the second, four, th four million, third, 14, 25th, 37. Uh, and then we hit the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th century, relatively low uh, growth because it was primarily limited to the Roman Empire. All the way up here until the 13th century. Now we, we start to expand the European project uh, up. I imagine there was a plague in there somewhere. But now look in the, the, the age of discovery, 16th century, 100 million, and then 130 million, 204. And then look at the jump, 558 million uh, uh, professing Christians 
and then we come to our time, which I said, I think the last data I saw was 2.2 million, um, 2.2 billion. So uh, the big jump, and you can see uh, the um, where these expansions took place uh, based on the color, the darker, the, the blue um, is the more recent, the expansion. There's a great, uh, I think YouTube that, that actually does this in real time where it shows how Christianity expands. It also shows when it contracts because we had quite a penetration in Asia at one time and, and lost it completely um, in, in, in over a, a period of time. The explorers went and the missionaries went with them. Why were the missionaries running off with the explorers? The great command, the great, great uh, commitment. Yeah. Yeah. A commission, go, I mean. Great go commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, right? You got it. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The brave uh, ones. The brave it, ones. It's, um, it's streaming now, but the black robe, I don't know if I talked about the black robe last week. Um, it's the missionary effort of um, one of the orders, I don't remember the order, uh, Dominicans maybe, to um, Native American tribes. And uh, it's kind of a, um, interesting why the, the man chooses to, to you know, give his life to this. And it, it's all about this idea that, that these Indians are, are going to hell forever. And that, that it's our responsibility to stop people anywhere from going to hell. And they, you know, that idea that you could stop somebody from that eternity in peril um, was a driving force for the missionaries, the zeal to, uh, to bring people into heaven, really. Um, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So hometown, Judea and Samaria, a little further out and then to the ends of the earth. The idea of this expansion is right there in the, um, in the uh, scripture. Uh, the colonial missions have a mixed um, reputation. Uh, the early patterns of colonialism focused on saving souls, as I said, but that was primarily by converting people to the colonialist culture and their idea of what faith looked like. So not too long ago, we've been hearing about the horrors of the Indian schools. Are you familiar with the, uh, the, the Native American schools in the U.S. where okay. they, they were, people were pulled away as children to these schools and um, they are culture was taken away their language um their name everything about them was taken away um and what trauma you know that that, that caused and how much was lost in the mistaken understanding that the only way you could be a christian would be a european christian and the only way you could probably be a christian would be to be an english speaking person and to wear the right clothes and then to use a fork and a knife. The whole idea that the culture was the gift to the savages, to the heathens, the, the, the whole culture, um, obviously, um, you know, very imperialistic. Um, the great white hope uh, it descends upon your culture and you are, you lose all your culture to get Jesus. Um, and one wonders in those time frames if they went to places where um, the colonial uh, preacher looked nothing like the Mediterranean Jesus, you know, in, in, in any way, shape, or form, and yet said, this is what you must be like to become a Christian. This is a ongoing in the sense that um, if you want to dig deep into the unrest in Muslim countries, you'll often find the great sense of um, 
fear and frustration about the way that uh, our faith comes along with with all of the um, cultural um, um, things that we have developed here in the West. So um, I'm just, if you're watching China right now, you know, these these people um, only, a, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, we had Tian, Tiananmen Square. And, and the difference between Tiananmen Square was there were only a few people that could capture what was going on in Tiananmen Square. Do you see the, the, the protests right now in China? Everyone has a cell phone and they're filming it and sending it all over the world. You know, um, it's fascinating. But this is what the dictators fear, right? This is what they fear. Uh, the truth will set you free. But the uh, idea that uh, um, we have to protect ourselves from Western influence, I, I experienced that in my first um, ministry or mission work um, that was in India. Uh, we were, after uh, a period of time, uh, there was a change in leadership in the uh, prime minister and a, a man named Modi uh, became the um, prime minister of India. Um, he is uh, supported by activist Hindus who do not want uh, foreign Christian involvement. And so we, we've, we had to stop going to India so as not to jeopardize our programs. Um, so um, that fear... Uh, that we will bring with our culture, uh, our Jesus, and then th thereby subverting um, their uh, their uh, understanding of control and way of life. The later patterns became more enlightened and also focused more on just helping our neighbor, loving our neighbors. So you saw more missionaries go that, that were uh, there to start hospitals, schools, um, doom acts of charity, uh, the uh, uh, idea that, you know, if we want to show them that we care, that that our Jesus is worth believing in, we have to show them with our hands and our feet. And the uh, ministry has become much more native oriented. And, and that's probably good. We had a, a missionary that had gone to India uh, prior to us uh, having our exposure and um, he was going from town to town with Bibles and really pushing, getting Bibles out there. And he was starting this ministry and, 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 and reaching people. Um, but then he was um, sort of stopped in his tracks and sent away and told he couldn't come back. And what was interesting is in his departure, they took the Bibles and they started churches. The Indians themselves, they started churches. And the leadership in India, uh, because of that approach, is more native-led than it is uh, Western um, Christian-led. And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. So the negative early approach continues to be a kind of a corrective. And if you were to go to any kind of missionary training now, you would see the latter. They would expect you to learn the language, not for them to learn your language. They would expect you to um, serve them and to learn their culture. Um, I quite consciously wore a, a lungi when I went to Bangladesh. Um, it it uh, wasn't comfortable for me. It felt very strange, but it immediately signaled to them that I was. Um, respectful of their culture. Now, if I could have learned the language, that would have been even better, but can't understand a word of it. <laughs> so we see um, with this move, now the Jesus who is a man for the world, um, he even starts to take on uh, personas in the artwork, an Asian uh, Jesus with decidedly Asian features. Uh, a, a Jesus in the in the the model of a Buddha uh, or in lotus uh, of Hindu or Buddhism, and then of course the the, the black Jesus, um, 
And these all become now um, examples of how each culture begins to uh, adapt Jesus to their own meaning. Um, and uh, that doesn't always uh, correlate to ideas of Jesus that we would have, but sometimes it, it might open up uh, new ideas of Jesus in, in those cultures. Certainly the idea of Jesus being um, uh, in, the, in the model of a Zen-like figure uh, has its place. Uh, he went away to pray um, often. The um, the exploited uh, Jesus of the black culture. He certainly was man with the thorns around his head. So in summary, um, we have uh, our last one is completed, the man for the world. And uh, who knows what's going to come next in terms of images. Uh, I started off the study. I said, uh, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And I think we can see that the answer through history, um, did many different answers. Um, but I think we are still affirming that there is the same Jesus. It's just that we see him in new ways um, as we would see Jesus differently as a child to an adult. Um, we continue to appreciate um, who he is uh, for us at each time. And I still think that how you answer the question, who is Jesus, is the most important factor in how you will live your life. Uh, I don't know that, that, um, that there's any way around that. If Jesus is um, a liberator for you, then you will be on the side of the poor. If Jesus is... Um, the king of kings you will be affirming of his lordship over all um political uh, realms if he's the crucified christ you will understand suffering as a force of redemption uh, uh in our world if you look at him as the monk who um rules the world you'll see him as um uh, having the characteristics of humility um and um poverty um, not of spirit, but of, of material things. Each way could lead you uh, to make your own moral uh, and personal choices. So if anybody was to throw out a Jesus to come, any any thoughts? Uh, you don't have to make a title for it, but just uh, what do you see in, in on the horizon uh, ways that, that, that people might um, be seeing Jesus uh, in, in maybe the next era how about the peacemaker mm -hmm. We're, it's time for that again you think <laughs> does that ever stop never stops <laughs> trying to figure out how he's going to make the transition from to the digital environment of the world Mm -hmm. yeah the cyber jesus yeah that Three, that's right 3d mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there an ai uh artificial intelligence uh uh, uh influence at some point in time uh, do you have answers to these questions i hope nope global <laughs> global weather jesus you know the 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 one who um um controls the wind and the waves the climate change jesus climate change christ there you go <laughs> i i don't think we can assume that he will go away. Um, however, let's hope not. It is it is a possibility that our culture will uh, continue to be less fascinated uh, and focused on Jesus. Uh, but it isn't true elsewhere. My my morning was spent with my friend from Bangladesh, who 
just wants to know more and more and more about Jesus. And he's he's got dozens of people in his community that want to know more and more about Jesus. Um, so I don't I don't think that that he'll disappear. He may change his relevance. Um, he may be the genesis for a rebirth. We're wondering about uh, the institutional church and and um, I think as one who served it, that there is much good left in it. But we also know that there could be any other kind of movement. The um, the one that strikes me is the Christ of the of recovery. You know, the twelve step Jesus. Probably more religious activity going on through the recovery movement than than almost any other place. Um, and so that may turn out to be, um, you know, the Jesus for the broken. Um, that may turn out to be uh, another influence. So if, um, if you feel comfortable, um, share something um, as we wrap up here that you're... Um, that you you feel like you either learned or are going to think about more about Jesus. We'll start with uh, anybody from Advent Square. I was struck by the fact that it seems like every group of people or every uh, generation wanted Jesus to be what they wanted him to be. Mm -hmm. They were more influenced by their need which was very limited it was very each one really limited jesus mm -hmm. big big um danger right yeah. he's bigger than all these right what did you he's bigger than all these any anyone um alone would be incomplete liberation theology has been uh, critiqued for having significant Marxist um, connections. Yeah. Um, the King of Kings authorized conquering kings. Um, Martin Luther authorizes the peasant uh, revolt to be put down, you know, and all of them were looking so narrowly, I think, at their one view of Jesus. Uh. I very much like the way the book ends where it refers to a phrase by St. Augustine, a beauty ever ancient, ever new. Mm -hmm. You are a St. Augustine fan. I sure am. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Any thoughts, Pat? Well, it's just that no matter which view I look at, even in trying to think forward like to the cyber Jesus, uh, I keep coming back to the only thing I can fall back on is WWJD, because if I try to figure out what he would do in the situation I'm trying to think through, it's not really that difficult. Uh, he said in the scripture that he has given us all the information we need. And uh, it's got to be in there. We just have to figure out what it is. And have enough time to do that. <laughs> I I think that there's a renewal in a going on throughout the country and throughout the world that more people are turned on to Jesus and things are happening that we don't know about all over. So that might be the answer to the question coming coming down the road here. Uh, any, thoughts, any thoughts, Bob Zybeck? Oh, Bob just likes the early images of Christ when he, it was God coming down here in human form. In fact, I even believe that he gave up all his godly powers when he was down here. I think all the miracles he did was through the father. Mm. So, because Boy, if Christ was here and he had his godly powers, boy, he could do all that stuff he, he could do. That'd be easy to do. But if he was human like us, boy, that put
puts it on a whole new perspective. So I just like those early images. Yes, he's probably looked up to as, as, as history goes on, as people are oppressed and looking for that liberator and he has stepped up to that. And, but I like the early images of him. Good, good. April and Dave, anything uh, you guys been thinking about or discussing? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's the, <clears throat> I was, I find it interesting, I should say, is that, you know, growing up, you have an image of what Jesus was, and that's, you know, for all of us, what might have been a different image, but then as you learn and grow in Christ and, and in your relationship, you start to allow the possibility that he can be anything. He can be, you know, anything to anybody, and he is the answer. So, um, I've I've learned to not focus so much. It used to be just, you know, I got to see the picture, I got to, um, you know, see the face. But now it's more of I just need to be with him. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. I think he needs to ride a Harley into town and straighten everybody out. <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> no, seriously, um, I really look at it on the idea that we, uh, it's a, it, to me, I'm looking for a rebirth. You know, that yeah. I'm really looking at the idea that we've gone full circle and we have the, everyone has got to a point where the negativity doesn't work. Mm. And, you know, we, we have to move forward and we have to look for someone that is going to lead us forward. And I think when you look at everything that has happened in your life, there's really only one person that can lead everyone forward. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's very good. Yeah. James, anything you want to throw in the hat there? Sorry about that, gang. I just uh, I had to take a call, but I'm back. I'm, I'm enjoying. Keep going. Any, any particular image of Jesus that um, either has captured you or you think might be on the horizon? Um, one that's captured me that you addressed like four weeks ago. And this is ridiculous that it's just hitting me so hard now, but it's the image of Jesus as the teacher. Mm. Um, being Orthodox, we, we really just groove on the cosmic Christ. Okay. And I think sometimes we forgot that he's, he was one of us. Um, and just the simple teaching Christ. Mm. And by the way, this was powerful. I, I went and saw this movie uh, over the weekend called The Chosen. It's a Apparently it's a TV show and, and they released uh, season three in the movie theaters and it, it deals with Jesus after the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I'm so used to the cosmic dimensions of Christ. I guess I never really thought enough about him just sitting on a hill teaching. Mm -hmm. and, and it just, it, I got to tell you, it kind of blew me away. Awesome. Yeah. And I think you, you, uh, certainly could add to the mix um, your perspective because I'm I'm certain that uh, Pelican um, did draw more upon Eastern European influences than than other Western historians might have um, and that that sometimes was the stuff that was the hardest for me to to, to and, get and, but, and that's um, that's where I'm kind of most comfortable and you're correct Yaroslav Pelikan was very, very comfortable in Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah. Um, yeah. He very much liked and felt at home with that ecclesiological Christ. And in some ways, his book, while bringing that to the West, was also saying to the East, hey, there's, there are these whole other dimensions you need to look at. Yeah. Daryl, anything you want to throw in? Uh, your comment about AI is scary <laughs> Be, because because i look I, I i can i can see somebody 
trying to reinvent Christ through artificial intelligence instead of what's writ written in the Bible mm -hmm. and leading the masses in a different direction. Right. That would, that, that would be pretty scary, but you know, they, they talk about so many things in I, AI that I, I guess you could get it right, but there's so many ways to get it wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'll say. Anything going on at the deals end of the woods here? Well, I was thinking along the same lines as, as Jim about uh, Jesus being a teacher, because even as, as a child, he was teaching in a temple and throughout his, you know, everything we know about him on earth, that's what he did as he taught. And um, I think, I don't know, you or Dave reached on the fact that the Bible is uh, <laughs> a teaching tool for us all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's basically a guide for our lives. And uh, we just have to discipline ourselves to follow it. So. Right. Teresa? Well, you know, it's hard because if you take one, then there's almost like an opposite, you know, Jesus, when you say, you know, um, he was the Prince of Peace liberator, you know, um, there, there was almost like a flip side with each of these, you know, portrayals of Jesus. And um, it, it really broadened, you know, it made me think that you have to, again, accept everything aspect of him and um, there were many that I learned through this too so I really appreciate that lots I learned yeah. but you know when you talk about the bridegroom of the soul you know or the poetic you know um Jesus but then you know the liberator you know one who um you know, liber he fights for the little guy, you know, he's on the side of the oppressed. And so it just, it, it was very fascinating, very fascinating. Good. Steve Lane, I know you made it for a couple of our sessions. Anything come to your mind? You have to turn on your microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, I apologize to all of you, really, because I've only come to a couple of these, and really, Ron Laverne's been the instigator of getting me on board here. It's been just an interesting travel down my road of learning more about Christ, and I thank you all for that. And as a reflection of that, I Denise and I were taking our good friend who's only 99 years old out to dinner tonight at the local restaurant and we had a wonderful time. He had a chance to vent there and tell us about his life and more of the things he was interested in. And he happens to be Jewish. And I think our conversation together was very helpful to him, but it certainly doesn't have the in-depth look at it as you have all created here tonight for me. So it's a challenge for me to try to catch up on the next series there of and be a larger part of that. So I'm into the into the basics of this, which you people are way ahead of me in this process. So Thank you for that. Well, thank you. I'm, I wanted to experiment with this because, um, you know, I, well, for one thing, I, it's just a joy for me to get to be involved in, you know, looking at these things with other Christians and getting their perspectives. And, and uh, I feel, I'm grateful for your participation um, and also grateful to the church for allowing me time to prepare it's quite a luxury that um, I have an opportunity to study um, mm -hmm. as part of my job. And so thank you uh, for supporting that because um, I think you probably um, would not find 
this topic addressed in a way that would meet your needs as well by just any stranger. Um, you know, I think having your pastor uh, be able to present something like this is maybe especially unique. I hope it's especially valuable. And I, all of these have been um, archived on YouTube in our playlist. If you come across historic history lovers or intellectuals or non-believers or Jesus lovers, please refer them and, and see what they might uh, get out of it. I know they'll have to put the time in, uh, but uh, certainly um, there might be people in your life that, that, uh, that you know, would be fascinated or interested in this. I'm going to offer another uh, Zoom starting in the new year. And as I said uh, in my email today, open to suggestions uh, for what that might look like. But I probably want to do something that is not quite so intense in terms of information and maybe lends itself to a little more time for uh, conversation or even uh, you can use breakout groups with uh, Zoom and allow people to go to, you know, little groups of twos and threes. So might look at something uh, that would lend itself to that. Um, I I think that I picked up, I, I bit off an awful lot. We we ate an elephant together is what we did, uh, <laughs> one, one mouth at a time. But uh, you, you, you can at least wear the badge, say I survived, who is Jesus. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you all. Russell, you want to say anything before we go? Yes, brother. And <laughs> yeah, I just let to join today and I was sleeping and I went to bed late. Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks God, because it was a big privilege to learn together here. And the finally, I'd like to say, and my view here, uh, Jesus is Heavenly Father, and uh, He is love. Mm. And mm. Mm, way maker and miracle worker. And that's my view here. And yeah, I'd like to say big, big I amen. Mean, what if I learned that? <laughs> Yeah, I told Russell this was going to be as clear as uh, mud for him because we'd be talking about uh, Western history, but um, he was game, and so I appreciate that. Saying this is the the one the man who's starting the new church in uh, Bangladesh, and uh, and we are actually excited to say that we're supporting him renting his first uh, facility. So within the next month, he'll be having uh, worship in his own uh, church facility. Um, and we're it. very excited about that. Yes. Yeah. Up until Thank now, you. it's been, he's only had his own apartment. So it's been crowded to say the least. So Yes. So, and if John will be praying for us. We will be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So thanks to everyone. And um, we will, I will send in you the outline of the whole thing as a attachment if you you know care to to save it on your computer or, or look at it and uh, i do have another link for artwork um but uh, if you have thoughts about what you'd like to look at in january um i i really like doing this i think this is a useful uh way to reach people that really don't want to make the trip in at night or um friends that might be intimidated to come to some kind of bible study um you know where they're with Christians and feel pressure. Um, so hopefully we can continue this again. Let me let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, the burning question of our whole life should be, who exactly is Jesus for us? And um, as we struggle with that answer, give us the gift of your Holy Spirit that me, we may reply uh, in ways that are multidimensional, that um, respect the wholeness of Jesus, that uh, take our own culture into context, but also seek to transform our culture through Jesus. And um, but most of all, bless us to know that um, even as Jesus remains in the end, uh, a bit of a mystery to us, that he knows us and he knows us completely, gave his life for us and is our savior. In his name we pray, amen. 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 Take care, everybody. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right.
Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning, Paramhara. <laughs>